All right, let's get started. So welcome everybody to the top five design tips for a winning graphical abstract. We're gonna go really deep on some of the concepts and actually walk through a tutorial, kind of a before and after or a figure makeover of an existing real figure that one of you have submitted. And so hopefully you can walk away with some tips and tricks, whether you're a brand new BioRender user or a BioRender veteran, um, I hope you'll walk away with some useful tips from this webinar. So what we'll cover today is a brief intro. We'll dive right into the five tips for a winning graphical abstract. So that's either you know, for a contest or beyond. We still want you to be able to make great figures for submitting to journals, uh, even for presentations or your thesis. Figure making tips are generally pretty ubiquitous. Of course, there are some considerations for graphical abstracts in particular, but hopefully you'll walk away with tips that you can apply to your general figure making processes. And then again, we'll apply some of the concepts from theory into practice through a figure makeover. Okay, so again, those of you who are brand new to BioRender, this is kind of a snapshot of what you can expect, but it sounds like a lot of you are BioRender veterans as well. Of course, common use cases of, of BioRender we're seeing more and more are you know, publications like graphical abstracts or general journal figures, presentations, lab meetings, probably online, of course, more and more now, um, grant applications, research proposals, really end-to-end -end the sort of scientific uh, endeavor and probably will find some use for BioRender along the way. So we'd like to kind of define, you know, what is a graphical abstract? It's a relatively new concept, I think, and a lot of journals are jumping on this and some even mandate it now. So it's really helpful for us to know, you know, what is this new trend and what is it, how is it different from other figures? So we're defining a graphical abstract as sort of a single image that is intended to give your reader an immediate understanding of the stories or article's main message. So this means that your graphical abstract should actually be distinct from figures or diagrams in the rest of the article itself. Uh, in fact, it should be kind of an overview as opposed to one of those you know, six panel figures in the results section. It's a little too granular to show for a graphical abstract. So just to kind of you know, warm up today to the webinar and, and get our feet wet in the kind of before and after examples that we will be going through together, here's a few that we went through in past webinars. If you've attended them, this might look familiar. So looking at something like this, we'll go through the principles of how to lay out something a little bit uh, more clear. I think the content here is really interesting. So we selected this as an example to show of a before and after. But what we did for this webinar is we went through how to realign sequences, how to label things a little bit better, and how to let the story flow a little bit more smoothly. It looks like if you follow my mouse, it actually goes around left to right around the bend, and then it kind of forks in the road here. So that was a little bit confusing, I would say, as far as uh, legibility. And again, the content's really interesting, so we really want to highlight the story from beginning to end. This is the after, so if I toggle quickly again, the before and after, you'll notice that we rearranged the elements to be pretty horizontal, and again, kind of typewriter back to the beginning, and then left to right again. So this is a really nice way to lay out long sequences of events that might be from, say, one to 10, one to 20, hopefully not that many steps in one page or a graphical abstract, but if you do end up having multiple steps that you need to show, it's really important to make sure that you follow standard uh, composition rules. So this is a nice left to right composition, kind of forming a Z shape. If you follow my mouse here, it's a nice soft Z or Z, however you say it. So again, before and after, of course, we numbered the figures as well, numbered the steps. So you really kind of uh, clarify to your reader where to start and where to end. Here's another before and after we did, so a beautiful you know, content, maybe nice color choice in a way too. Um, what we thought was um, the orientation felt a little bit disorienting. So we started from the top left, and of course we're showing the anatomy here of the small intestine and the gluten molecules. Um, but the zoom in view actually ends up being a little bit of a, a, a neck twister. So you have to kind of 
tilt your head 90 degrees if you're doing that right now in front of your screen to be able to see the direction of those molecules in the lumen of the intestines going down now towards the page. Uh, and not only that, we've got this kind of offshoot. It is clockwise, which is nice, but there's a lot of things happening as far as which way to tilt your head and which direction to follow. Um, there aren't any numbers, so I'm not really sure where the story begins and ends. And this is actually one of the biggest requests from editors at journals. And I specifically interviewed a few uh, editors at Cell Press to say, you know, when you get submissions from authors with graphical abstracts, what is the one mistake you see? And it was clearly the same pain point across editors. And that is they never really know where to begin and end in a graphical abstract. So they end up reading it from the middle and then getting distracted. So that's one of the really important points is flow of the information, the composition, and really numbering if you can, the steps one, two, three, four, if you can label them. Here was the after of that version. All we did was turned at 90 degrees and then you know made the molecule flow from left to right here. So literally the exact same components just reoriented a little bit. It was actually again 90 degrees. And you can see what a difference it makes as far as clarity. Uh, we also added this row of epithelia to go left to right. We didn't really need to show the lumen again because it was already shown in the top left and that was clear enough. So we got rid of that and then just kept it as one layer like so. And then of course numbered the steps. So one, two, three, four, five. So even if it was a, a kind of unconventional orientation, at least I can follow the path using the numbers. So that was a really cool kind of before and after. Again, I'll toggle before and after. And fully made in BioRender using our pre-made icons. Uh, again, no drawing skills required. Great, so let's dive into the five tips on how we were able to accomplish those before and afters, and then we'll apply it again at the very end of this webinar um, and put those theories into practice. So those of you that just joined, I actually launched a poll earlier in this webinar asking if you've used BioRender before, what is your current field of research, and if you have submitted to our graphical abstract contest yet, just a little side note there, we'd love to know if you have or haven't. So if you'd like to throw in your votes, I'll give you five seconds to do so and hopefully it shows up there in your Zoom panel. And I'm gonna go ahead and end the vote so you can all see who else is in the room. And very cool, it looks like we only caught a fraction of you all, maybe you're a bit shy to, to submit your answers, that's okay, um, but really cool, nice diverse group as far as the type of research you're doing, really neat. And again, those of you who don't intend to submit to the after our contest, hopefully by the end I'll have convinced you to, uh, but at least you'll walk away with some tips on how to make a better figure. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing and dive right into the tips itself. So these are the five general concepts we'll cover. One is kind of plan ahead, pretty self-explanatory, but I'll dive a little bit more into that. Um, thinking about you know, translating a graphical abstract into words, what is that? What is the interplay between the graphical abstract and the abstract itself? Uh, three is looking a little bit into the color contrast and saturation of your figure. I know it's a little bit hard to color pick and pick colors that match sometimes. So we'll go into some tips on how to do that. Four is the consistent use of arrows, lines, and labels. We talk about this a lot. Really important for communicating to your viewers on first glance. And then number five is what we colloquially call the sort of Twitter slash text message test, which I'll show you how uh, we do at the very end. So first tip here is to plan ahead. Um, we recommend pencil to paper. I think there's nothing better than that that exists out there right now. Uh, we have digital products, this whole application, BioRender is digital, same with the Zoom webinar, but nothing really beats pencil to paper. So I recommend doing that even when you begin. So try to sketch out your story. So again, pencil and paper are best, but you know, thinking about the main characters of your story, who are the main actors, the best supporting actors, um, you know, what is a nice to have versus you know, need to have, and does it warrant having sort of a key or a legend, labels? Those things can be worked out in the sketch phase. It's really hard to work it out after you've started putting elements on your canvas. Um, 
or even you know your final layout. Even the best professional artists today, they go through multiple, multiple, multiple sketches. The best paintings you see on the walls, there's probably nine or 10 versions of that painting in small kind of five inch by five inch sketches, quote unquote, in the artist's studio because they actually practice doing that exact painting over and over and over. So it kind of loses that romanticism of it being spontaneous. They actually practice that painting before they go to the final uh, painted version that you see in, in galleries. So moral of the story is sketch out the main characters. And then this is going back a little bit to the traditional, more kind of scientific approach to concept design or composition. So generally speaking, our eyes like to follow from left to right, up to down. That's how we read sentences. That's how we read words. Um, and generally, you know, that's how gravity falls. So I think we just like to read things from top down. Uh, cyclical is another nice orientation for something that you know happens over and over. Maybe it's phases in a cyclical pathway. Uh, the Z-shape formation was that sort of mouse model experiment that we saw previously. Um, M shape is kind of more reflected in posters. So you'll notice that from the intro, conclusions, um, everything in between forms a bit of an M shape. L shape is a little less conventional, but sometimes it's nice if you have a main figure that it's kind of straddling there. And then forks are, of course, when there's a decision tree or maybe um, you know two outcomes from one experiment, um, you can kind of show in a fork but I would never go the other way where it's reading right to left. The fork should always be pointing to the right or pointing down. If you follow those steps, you can actually come up with some really cool, funky um, orientations if you follow these rules. So if you kind of chunk, I guess, the, the step number with the title and the description, you can go cyclical, you can go linear, again, you can go Z shape, but really the key is to make sure each sequence is kind of uh, associated with itself very tightly. So essentially try to box in the content as close as possible so that elements of, for example, step two, don't bleed into step one or step three. It's very clear where one step ends and one step uh, begins. Okay, uh, here is that same concept applied across two different orientations. So exact same content in both illustrations here that we're toggling. One is a cyclical and one is a sort of Z formation here. But, you know, it's communicating quite um, different concepts, but just by changing the orientation, you can accomplish two different uh, compositions. So the take home message here again is to make sure your numbers and your image title and even the little icons associated with each step are nice and closely associated with that step itself. So they're nice and kind of chunked together. Okay, so we'll follow a little bit more into that during the live sketching. Um, number two is to think about how the words to describe the graphical abstract relate to the abstract itself. So many of you may submit abstracts for talks or posters. Uh, they're kind of a summary of what you're going to cover or what you've discovered or researched or are going to research. Um, so we're taking this example from an article that came out of the University of Toronto back in 2017 in an immunity issue. And this was a really nicely worded abstract, um, very succinct. Here was the graphical abstract version of that abstract. And one kind of tip that uh, the same editor at Cell Press mentioned to me um, and to communicate with you all is that, you know, editors will give you a word limit for your abstract, um, but they find that that sometimes gives leeway to add as much as, uh, you know, authors like within the graphical abstract itself, um, when really we should be limiting the content that goes into the picture as well. So think of, abstracts as being word limited, as well as graphical abstracts being sort of content limited. So kind of rule of thumb or takeaway from this slide is really that if you translate the information from the graphical abstract back into words, it should actually be less words than what you originally started with in the abstract itself. So this is a bit of a tip 
um, that again, some editors have left me with to give to you is that it shouldn't have more content than the abstract. It should have the same, if not less. So that's a nice kind of rule of thumb to think about. That will also help guide us to make the graphical abstracts much simpler and much clearer and really communicate one main message. Okay, so diving in a little bit more to the design side of things, talking about color contrast and saturation. If you've attended our previous webinars before, we talk a lot about complementary colors. If this concept is new to you, it's basically just a fancy way to say opposite colors on the color wheel. So they're colors that are directly opposite each other on this wheel. You've probably seen this right from grade one um, or kindergarten even. So, you know, red and green are opposite colors, kind of like Christmas colors. Blue and orange are exactly, you know, this di distance apart from each other on the color wheel. And then purple and yellow are, again, complementary or opposite colors. Uh, blue and orange, purple and yellow, really great combinations of colors. Red and green, of course, something that we shy away from a little bit um, for our sort of colorblind audience. And talking about color combinations and color saturation, uh, saturation is kind of the uh, level of pigmentation in a color. So again, thinking back to the painters that used oil paints or uh, you know tempera, it was basically the level or how much pigment was in the paint tube. Um, it's kind of the same concept here where I guess in modern days, you can think of it as a highlighter versus a pastel marker. So you want to be using, I guess, pastel markers as much as possible, if you want to think of it that way, with a strong enough outline, of course. But really, the strongest colors, the highlights, should literally be just that. You're highlighting the most important parts of, say, a pathway, instead of you know, taking your highlighter and, and uh, highlighting your entire notebook. Try to limit the saturated colors on your palette. And sorry if this is a little bit uh, jumping around here. This animation is a little bit fast. But basically the before and after really shows that we've subdued the color options and color choice and uh, let things fall back to be a little bit more pastel, even grayscale if needed. Um, you don't have to color every single thing a different color. Okay, so that's the idea of kind of saturation and holding back as far as the, the amount of color you use for your figure. And this is the idea of color value or kind of contrast. Um, the left panel, obviously, you know, orange and green, two different colors. But if you actually kind of knock back the color as a variable and turn it to grayscale, you'll notice that it completely disappears. So this is important if maybe a grant reviewer or a journal editor is printing your article in black and white for some reason, if they're you know, reviewing your image um, you know, sitting on their couch and they want to print it on their inkjet printer, um, if somebody is colorblind, if, uh, you know, their screens are bad quality, then, you know, you're going to lose a lot of resolution if your colors are too close in color value or lightness or darkness. So the rule of thumb here really is that you want to kind of preview things in grayscale if possible. Um, that's kind of a nice rule of thumb to get a nice gut check as to whether objects on your canvas are different enough in color value. Here it's not. Those proteins that are on top of the microtubule are far too light. So what we've done is we've changed the color to be darker. So in BioRender specifically, we have a preview in grayscale mode that we were in just now. It looked like a black and white world. That's because we turned on grayscale mode like so. And this is just a kind of a nice gut check. You don't have to keep this on during the entire illustration process. It's just a nice kind of final gut check when you're about to export your figure, just to make sure there's enough contrast in your image. We see this a lot, a lot as one of the biggest mistakes we see in figure making. And we're all victim to this. For example, if you're using a cell with a dark nucleus with DNA on top of the nucleus, nuclei generally stain darker so we're working already with kind of a, a limited color contrast palette. So sometimes we'll fall victim to that where the DNA disappears into the nucleus a little bit. So just be aware that you'll have to you know, adjust things, make them brighter, darker, to make sure those things stand out. So again, go, we'll go a little more into detail about that in the demo. 
Um, and then the fourth concept, which we won't dig into too much, is the use of consistent arrows, lines, and labels. Just wanted to leave you with this note that within BioRender, there are many different types of arrows. And this is very intentional because different arrow types uh, kind of communicate very different concepts depending on the type of arrow head. So this obviously general kind of pointed arrow shows directionality, movement, uh, past or future states. Um, I wouldn't use it for labeling objects because again, it communicates more about movement um, than it does with labeling an object. Um, the dots label here is what I would recommend using for labels. And of course, we all know that the flat bar at the end here means uh, inhibitor. And then we've got neurons and circular arrows as well for the right purposes. So just be aware that, you know, when it comes to arrows, uh, consistency is really the key. You don't have to memorize what all these arrows mean. Um, it's just good to be consistent in the arrow types that you choose to use. And again, we'll go through together in a demo. So why don't we jump out of this slide deck and go right into the demo. Um, if there are any questions that we've left unanswered, it looks like the webinar chat's blowing up here. So thank you for all your comments and questions. Everyone's dialing in from all over the world. So welcome. Again, very full room today. Um, what I'm gonna do is actually highlight one of the figures that we're gonna look at today together. So this is a figure that has been submitted into our graphical abstract contest. I thought it had really interesting content and definitely had its own challenges as far as communicating lots of stuff on one canvas. Many of you have probably been here before where you're finished your figure and you love it, but something's not quite sitting right. It, it feels maybe busy and you don't really know how to approach it or what to do. Um, you've asked your colleagues and they also say the same thing. It, it looks a little busy. Can you clean it up? And you don't really know, you know, what does that mean? How do you move forward from that? So um, this is, of course, if you maybe haven't gone to the sketch phase and then to this phase in the end, some of us jumped right into making the figure, which is totally fine. There, there are ways to salvage this. So what I'm going to do is open up my trusty um, kind of Photoshop page here. And now you don't have to use Photoshop. I'm just using this right now to kind of show a little bit of a demo as far as how I would approach sketching this out from scratch or how I would approach um, fixing this up. I've added a dummy paper texture here just to show you that, you know, imagine that we were in the room together and I wasn't in Photoshop, I'd just be using um, pencil to paper. Okay, so I've got my left picture here. That's the kind of before image that I'm gonna clean up for this person. And um, as far as graphical abstract dimensions, um, generally speaking, you know, there are rules to certain journals. So I think cell press, it's actually a five by five orientation. So you wanna make sure your image is square. I'm just gonna increase the opacity of my brush here so you can see it. There we go. So yeah, I would kind of draw out, you know, this is roughly the dimensions for that. Sorry, it's a little messy here. The point is to be messy though. For our graphical abstract contest, it is roughly seven by 10. Not roughly, actually, it's exactly seven by 10 we recommend. So I don't know, something like that ratio. So we'll just use this top part. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and kind of reorient this. So thinking back to our little cheat sheet of uh, different types of orientation that we recommend, um, I would say this probably based on all of this movement should fall into more of a cyclical flow. If I were to take a red marker and follow the path of this current image, again, really interesting content, but I was a little confused about the direction that my eye should follow. So this is number one. Um, number two is down here. And number three is up here. And number four is here. And then I think along the way, there's kind of you know, secondary movements happening around. There's this blood flow down below that was kind of leading my eye up here as well. So if you were to kind of infrared or follow someone's pupils as they walked around, visually walked around the composition, this is probably kind of what you'd see is this, you know, back and forth. And again, this definitely does not follow one of our recommended orientations. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of rework this composition to be a little bit more, again, in line with what we would consider an industry standard design. Um, I like that the story starts from the vessels. It's always nice to start with a little bit of anatomy just to orient your viewers. So I'll start from top left. I think stories should generally always start in the top left. Um, and then, you know, really, really messy. This should be embarrassing to show how messy it is, your sketch. Um, so top left, because I think everyone, again, reads generally from top left to bottom right. Um, if I go back here and I kind of, sorry, remove some of these lines. I should have put on a separate layer. Let me put that back. Um, if we were to do that, you could actually see that, throw these back in and turn it off for a second. Uh, it looks like that they're using, you know, arrows to show um, kind of anatomy of this T cell as well as showing directionality. So what we want to do again, it looks like the cell's migrating out of the vessel right here, but it's not actually leaving the vessel at this point. It's just kind of one of those zoom ins or anatomy of this object. So right away, we have an opportunity here to use arrows consistently by maybe doing one of these things, which is like a call out. Again, it's not gonna suggest movement, it's just gonna suggest um, kind of general uh, zoom in, if that makes sense. Let me paste that, and maybe I'll have the cell nice and large here, and you know, show the protein sticking out. So that's going to be the zoom in. So again, we're going to get rid of that arrow that's going to confuse our users a little bit or viewers. Um, and kind of make that number one roughly. And I think I'm going to try to follow kind of a loop or a cyclical pathway here. So we need to put the tumor on kind of the opposite end. So maybe it'll be roughly in this area. Um, and by nature, we're going to need number two to exist in this area. So if that's possible, let's see if we can kind of get the trafficking to fit up here. Maybe the cell's coming out this way. So that's already taking care of our action of the trafficking. The blood flow is coming out this way. And I like that they use the dotted arrow because it kind of suggests, if you're not an immunologist, um, and if you are, maybe you can chime in here if I get this right. I know Joseph, or Joe on our team is, has a lot of experience in this. So he's described to me that it's actually talking about how the T cells do find it difficult in some cases, at least in this person's uh, thesis, is that it finds it's um, getting to the tumor is actually not that easy. So locating to the point that it needs to do its work is actually not always guaranteed. So that's why the dotted line is there. It's not always a direct path or guaranteed or an easy route, that's kind of what's described with the dotted line. And using these elements helps to tell the story. If it was a thick solid line, then I would be convinced that it's for sure going to go right to the tumor. So the type of arrow that you use, again, is very communicative. Um, number three is tumor microenvironment, all the things that actually make it difficult um, kind of for the T cell to do its job. So maybe we'll put number three kind of in this area. And then, you know, some stuff's happening here. Again, don't have to be perfect. And then number four, if we can neatly tuck it away here, would be great to put down here. So we have some nice kind of clockwise motion happening. Again, not perfect, but a little bit better than what we had before. So we might need to introduce another T cell and then, you know, cancer cell. And then there's some cancer cells kind of blubbing off here. And then the proteins interacting with each other. So this is really messy. This is exactly what you want to be at as far as, you know, flushing out the general concepts. Okay. And now if I kind of use a red marker to draw over this, you'll see that the general flow is the blood coming in one, two, three, four. Uh, there's also something happening in the middle here with the T regulatory cells and then and the NDSCs. So maybe there's sort of a secondary story happening here. But again, it's not the main part of the story. And graphical abstracts, you want to make sure that you're communicating kind of one main concept. 
And you can think of the big arrow as this kind of gravitational force that everything else should kind of follow. Um, I wouldn't recommend going this way to tell your um, secondary stories. That's a bit of a kind of advanced tidbit, but just to know that everything should kind of follow this big arrow, almost like, again, a big gravitational force. Okay, so if I turn back on the original, much better orientation, much easier on the eye, easier on the editor's eyes, and eventually your viewership. So let's take this as a, I'm gonna just screenshot, it's gonna be pretty pixelated here, but I'm just gonna screenshot this as a bit of a cheat sheet as we move into BioRender to compose this uh, in just minutes. So going back to my Chrome browser, and again, those who are uh, familiar with BioRender, you'll know that it's a web-based browser. All you need is Chrome. Hopefully you're using Chrome. We are compatible with Safari and Firefox, but we recommend Chrome just because it's the best uh, kind of graphics rendering browser for software like ours. Um, I'm gonna log in with my demo account. And there we go, we've got my illustrations in the bottom, templates on top if I wanna start with a template and then folders if I wanna keep myself organized. If you don't already use that, I recommend it. And I'm gonna go into my graphical abstracts folder. And uh, what I'm gonna do is open up this figure, again, that was sent to us earlier. I'm gonna paste that sketch that I made in Photoshop right into BioRender. And if you ask any medical illustrator in the whole world, they probably do this either in Photoshop or Illustrator. They actually bring in their sketch into, this, into the file itself so they can refer to it. You can also split your screen so that you shrink your browser down and look at your sketch. Or even better, if it's on pencil and paper, it's actually next to your computer on your desk so you don't waste precious desktop space um, or you know, virtual desktop, desktop space for that matter. Um, so it was in my clipboard. So I'm gonna command V, which opened up this upload icon modal and hit upload. This is a kind of a little known fact that you can really copy and paste anything into BioRender. So this is our kind of uh, after that we wanna to get to from this. And I took a little bit of time ahead of this webinar and started to recompose it just for sake of time, but this is actually now a screenshot kind of like a cooking show. I've pre-made a couple of things here. Um, but basically, it's gonna be really easy to compose, again, this figure into a nice after figure. So what I've done, like my sketch, I've moved the vessel up to the top left here. Does that make sense? And then I've um, kind of left the tumor, I guess, somewhat to the bottom right here. It was, it was working there for our purposes. And then now comes the fun part. So what are we gonna do? Let's kind of get rid of this a little bit and now focus our attention on this sketch. Let's follow along here. So let's add a square to get that kind of anatomy of this object feeling. So here's that square. I just used our square object, so super easy. Probably label that right on top. And what we need is those trusty lines. I like to go with these faded lines because sometimes it looks like Something's kind of, it's, it's, it's zooming in. And I'm gonna shift click to make another line coming up up here. Now it looks kind of weird because it's actually fading the wrong way. So I'm gonna switch the direction at which it's fading by clicking this. So you see that back and forth we can do. And I'll probably color match to the box. And the box has a bit of a blue stroke to it. so. Um, I'm gonna pick more of a blue color. There we go. That's looking pretty good. If you really want, sometimes what I see is actually the use of a box around the object that you're zooming in from. If you really wanna orient your viewer, you don't always have to do this. Sometimes it's enough of the story just to do this and zoom in. Great, so now it doesn't look like it's actually leaving the vessel, we're just kind of having a little zoom in call out for that. Um, another thing what I would do is, I would just go ahead and orient your viewer by adding those car proteins right onto the T cell itself. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this version that has the proteins on it, shrink it way down, 
and then swap it out for this guy. So stories, you know, a little bit more consistent. Maybe, maybe there's another one floating downstream here as well. I suspect that the one that's trafficking is also going to have that protein on it. So let's look for that specific protein. There we go. And I can change this to maybe a different color if I like. And um, I guess I don't need these domains. I'm just going to delete those off the protein. This is the nice thing about BioRender 2 is that you can kind of modify the objects as you see fit. We can change the colors of these kind of sausages or domains. And if you want to color match exactly, then you can probably just color pick, but I'm just going to eyeball it for now. And that's good enough. So maybe I'll stick those onto the trafficking cell. Just again, to stay consistent, consistency is key here when someone new is coming to your picture, which is probably going to be most of the time if you're publishing a journal, publishing a figure. Okay. So what we're going to need now is some direction arrows. Um, oh, it looks like we lost that dark corner of this, of this vessel, which actually I kind of liked because it looked like it was coming from a tissue. So I'm going to add that back in. I think we have a nice blob tool. We can use this guy. It looks like a kidney, but it has dots on it. So it's telling me that I could probably, you know, move things around. So I'll make kind of a really rough, I don't know, in, interstitial color. And then I'm going to color pick that color way down here, all the way over. Come back. There we go. Remove that stroke. Hopefully you're picking up a thing or two about BioRender itself as I'm going through this. There are so many cool features within BioRender that you probably are going to miss a thing or two. So there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's really just, you know, what your preference is or what is suitable for, for your needs. Okay, so let's add kind of this label nearby. Maybe it could be below or on top. Tuck it in a little bit closer. Uh, trafficking. Okay, so let's get an arrow to come out and toward the tumor. So we're just going to use a really simple faded line like so. It comes pre-bent and pre-faded, which is nice, but you know you can always change the angle at which it's growing. Um, maybe I'll make it thicker because again, it's that big gravitational force, that biggest arrow coming through the illustration. Um, as I mentioned, I like the way it's dotted because it's not a guarantee that the cell is gonna get to the tumor. So dotted lines, really good for that. And maybe it's a little thick. I'll maybe knock it down to a five and play around with the kind of distance of that dotted line. So that's pretty nice, very clear story. And sometimes if you're feeling that the arrows are harsh or jumping out at you, I'll actually knock it down to a dark gray. So you can see here, it's very subtle, but sometimes that helps. We're also missing a little bit of directionality here with the blood flow. So I'm gonna add that arrow that was kind of coming through the vessel. And then if I zoom in here, I'm gonna actually add another arrow that then describes the cell leaving the vessel itself. So kind of a branch or a fork in the road. Maybe I'll go with the pre-dotted line. Again, it's not a guarantee that the cell leaves the vessel even. So I think, again, the story that they're trying to tell is that there are limitations to the way that the cell can reach uh, the tumor ultimately. Okay, oops, sorry, I'm moving around a lot here. So pretty good cyclical rotation. Um, one thing that I'll probably also add is kind of numbering my steps one to four. So I'm gonna bring in, let's see, where did it go? Here we go. I just took this right from the original figure, the kind of cells interacting with the T cell. That's looking pretty good. And 
you know, it doesn't have to be perfect as far as where the labels are, as long as, again, you're kind of generally following that overarching uh, composition. So I want to label one, two, three, and four. I'm going to come up here and select our numbering system, which is in our insert shape tab. So insert shape, I've got one, a text or pill shaped protein. Um, I'm going to select this and all I do is click onto my canvas. In one click, I get a perfect circle with a number one centered right in the middle. So that's great. I'll just add that here. Maybe I'll actually label it up here. And if you're finding that you don't have enough room, maybe you can nudge it down a little bit. Most of the time design is about kind of nudging things around. Sometimes we call it pixel pushing, which is not a great word in the design world. It's actually meant to say that, you know, you're a little too picky about something, but it does end up being that you're kind of moving things around. And sometimes you know, the devil's in the details anyway. So number two is trafficking. Change that to a two. Number three here is the kind of idea that there are hostile barriers in the tumor microenvironment that inhibits the T cells. So I'll add that there. Again, not perfectly cyclical, like a clock, but again, better than what we had before for a relatively complex concept. And I'm gonna type in four for number step four. I'll move this down a little bit. Again, it's about kind of nudging things here and there to get it to work. Oop. So already looking much, much clearer. Again, there's that kind of middle story happening here. So let's add um, maybe a T cell. Here's a basic one. I think we've got that same color. Maybe we'll type in just a general cell. Oops. There we go. We've got lots of different cell types. I'm just going to pick a couple of cells here. Maybe I've got lymphocyte. You can also try searching different types of search terms because sometimes our artists will keyword things in different ways. Just throw those into the mix and then scale it down just a tad. Again, not the main part of the story, but kind of a secondary story happening. And I'm going to throw in some inhibitor lines. Again, pre-made, so all you have to do kind of add it in. Again, following that general gravitational pull. I'm going to add my lines like so. And I'm just alt dragging to copy, by the way, if you're noticing that things happen on my canvas without my describing. Um, if you want to get really fast at BioRender, you can actually um, open up your keyboard shortcut and uh, open up the panel that'll make you faster and faster at using the tool. If you're on a Mac, it'll say, you know, Apple X or, um, you know, Command X. If you're on a PC, of course, it'll say Control. I think the, the numbers will change. I see a question here about how do you make grids? Um, you're probably looking at the top image here. This is a screenshot from a, a piece of paper. Um, you actually can turn on grids within BioRender. So I just turned on the grid system. If you are a bit of a stickler like me and want to align stuff, you can also increase or decrease the size of those grids. So that's an option if you want to start to align things. We also have the align tool. So if you want to align these two cells to be exactly on top of each other, you can do that as well. Okay. And let's see. Oh, we're missing one more inhibitor line that kind of shows the uh, molecules here. Coming over. I think I'll move this label a little bit more down. Okay, we're doing a pretty good job here. I think we've got much better flow of the story. Let's see if we're missing anything as far as major tips that we want to show. Um, if you want to maybe trim down the edges of this vessel is coming off to the side. It doesn't really matter in Byrunder because everything outside of the white borders doesn't ex export. So if I were to hit preview up here, 
everything inside the canvas will get exported. Everything outside the canvas is kind of like your workspace. So it doesn't really matter. But if you do want to crop things, you can actually use our crop function. You can even rotate the crop if you want to get fancy and kind of clean up the edges there. This might be useful for when you actually have to crop stuff on your canvas. So there you go. That's a nice little tip. Um, let's see. And we also should make, again, consistency is key. So steps one, two, three, and four, the main title of those are all kind of different fonts. I don't know if you noticed that or not. If you're a bit keen about fonts, you may have picked up on that. So I'm going to go ahead and maybe select size 14. Maybe I'll bold it. So now it's becoming really clear what are the subtitles for each step here. A little more obvious, one to four. And again, our arrows are more consistent. We're using inhibitor lines where we need. And I think we're doing a pretty good job here. Let's see if we've missed anything. Labels, we're doing well. If you wanna, again, label anything in particular, and it's kind of confusing because you have a lot of things on your canvas, you can go ahead and use the dot arrow. This is a really nice way to kind of label objects. But again, I would use um, this dot at the end of the line instead of the uh, arrowhead. And maybe not that thick either. I could maybe make it a one. There you go. Again, if you really want to label objects in the scene. There we go. Okay, so let's hit preview again just to get a final gut check. And speaking of gut checks, we could do a bit of a preview and grayscale check as well. Did we lose anything in the story? Is anything disappearing? Let's look at the before as well. It looks like the cells in the vessel were kind of disappearing in the grayscale. So let's see if we've fixed that in hours. It looks like it's much brighter. I think because I've knocked back the opacity of this vessel itself. We could probably do a bit of a better job if I go back into color mode and make the blue maybe a brighter blue for the T cell itself. So, uh, you know, thinking about maybe using a different color combination something darker perhaps. But again, all up to you. See how that stands out a little bit more? I would you know, obviously change the nuclei color to be a bit darker. But that stands out a little bit more. So again, if that's the main part of your story, the highlighter should go on the main part and the most important part. And again, I'm repeat that in the main image as well. So for our purposes of time, I'm going to go ahead and export this image. Um, if you're finding that your arrows are getting in the way, you can again change the opacity of it by sliding the opacity slider. Okay, let's hit export. And I'm going to go with maybe JPEG, 150 DPI. And it's going to download right to my computer. And I'm going to go back to our presentation deck. There was the before. Let's in import the after. Nice and clean, high resolution. And let's check out the results of that. So here's our before image. And here is our after. Much kind of cleaner orientation. I know exactly where to look. Left, right, cyclical in a way. And again, here was the before, which is a little bit more confusing. My eyes kind of jumping around. And here's the after. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, last kind of thing to wrap up here is the idea of the Twitter or text message test. So this is a um, tweet that I saw last week um, that kind of described an article in Nature. And it was tweeted out the picture was the main part of the story, it was the main event. And really what the idea of graphical abstracts are from the, I guess, editors or journals point of view is also to be able to highlight or disseminate your, your article on things like social media. So can the figure itself stand up against 
uh, you know, all the noise out there and really invite viewers to now click on that link and, you know, read your article. A lot of the times the figure becomes in itself a nice kind of uh, call out or advertisement to say, hey, look how cool this story is. Um, you should come and read the article. So it should kind of be able to stand alone without the aid of the article itself, uh, nor the abstract. Okay, so just keep that in mind that the figures can be used outside of the purposes of the article itself. Again, things like on uh, social media platforms. Um, the text message kind of angle to this is again, adding a figure to a text message to a friend or a colleague that might be in your specific field or outside, if they can respond with what's happening in the message or message, um, happening in the figure, then you've done a good job of it. But if they can't get the main image or the main concept in the image in first glance, then um, you'll probably have to go back and again, tweak the image to, to suit your needs. All right. So that kind of concludes the main tips. As uh, the last few minutes here wrap up, I would love to kind of share how easy it is to submit something like this to our contest. Again, there's no fees associated. I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter contest right from the gallery view here. You can also kind of open up this form and then pick the figure from your personal gallery if you want. And then go ahead and add a couple of bits of information about it, literally, you know, four to five questions, and then agree to the terms, continue, and then voila, you've submitted to a graphical abstract contest. Here's a bit of a sneak peek into a few that your colleagues have submitted. I think there are uh, thousands now that have been added. So really great way to network with your colleagues. Connect with others that also are in your field. So some of these subfields might relate to you, cell biology, uh, bioinformatics, plant and animal science, uh, microbiology and immunology. If I click that, it'll actually reduce the search results to be relevant to me. And maybe there's somebody in this kind of gallery view that I'd like to kind of collaborate with. So this individual has some nice comments on hers. I'll upvote. It looks like I already voted for it, actually. Um, if I click on their name, it looks like they're a grad student in Buenos Aires, and they're studying immunology and virology, looking for collaborators on their research. So a really neat way, since we're all kind of isolated right now and not able to go into conferences and meet all the exciting uh, colleagues in your field, this is a really cool way to connect with them, um, you know, as well as obviously the chance to win some prizes. So if you see our early bird prize winners, these in individuals have already won anywhere between 250 uh, to a thousand dollars, I believe, for the submission, and there's lots more prizes to give out. So again, don't be afraid to submit. It looks like you know lots of people have already uh, done so within your fields. So we'd love to see the kinds of images you submit. They could be as simple as this, very clear and concise concepts. It could be um, images or research that you yourself have discovered. It could be someone else's research that you're kind of recreating their graphical abstract for. And of course you have to just cite them properly, but you are welcome to submit that figure. It could just be a generally interesting concept um, that you're trying to illustrate. Really it's pretty, it's pretty open as far as the type of figure you'd like to submit, as long as you cite your sources. Okay, so that's the graphical abstract contest. Again, highly encourage you to submit and um, Looking forward to see what you create there. So I'm gonna to toggle back to my slide deck and uh, we will conclude there. Thank you so much for joining us today. And of course, thank you to my colleagues, Joe and Brigida and Cindy for helping to answer all of your wonderful questions in the Zoom webinar chat. And I'll stick around for another minute or so if there were any outstanding questions here that couldn't get answered. Looks like our colleagues did a great job of answering them anyway but definitely feel free to reach out to support at Byrender if you have any outstanding questions outside of this. Um, oh, one really cool thing I'll also leave you with is our Byrender um, vaccine tracker. This is also something that, I, uh, that Joe is working on. Really cool initiative. 
we've actually done it in a little bit more of a, of course, design centric and beautiful way of highlighting the race to a vaccine or therapeutic. So uh, basically we're updating this almost every day, um, every other day at least, I believe. We've got a little activity feed here of all the big research happening. And then here is that kind of race to the finish. So here's a vaccine tracker. I'm gonna click it right into the Zoom chat there if you wanna click it and take a look at that. Really, really cool. All the candidates here. It's always fun to see the top contenders as you know more of a global initiative amongst multiple organizations. If you scroll down, again, the race to a drug, a therapeutic. It's really cool to see kind of all the progress that's happening right now as a concerted effort amongst multiple scientists and groups. And of course, you can sign up here to get those regular updates. But anyway, I thought it was a really, really cool thing to highlight here as you round out this webinar. Awesome. All right, thank you so much for your uh, attention and uh, enthusiasm right to the end. Really appreciate you sticking around and look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. We're gonna go through many more tutorials like the one we did today, kind of a before and after image. And yeah, look forward to seeing what you create. Thanks for joining. Have a great rest of your day.